Hey, we're in the book of Nehemiah, and we're talking about picking up the pieces, and I'm not going to rehearse what we've covered already, but I am going to talk about the fact that today we're finally getting to the point where there's a completion of the project. Have you ever noticed that some projects take longer than you think? Uh, a lot of my projects take a lot longer than I think. Some of you may not have noticed, but we're missing all of the apparatus for um, the, the wireless microphones that used to be sitting on the stage. That's because uh, we cut a hole in the platform and dropped them down inside the platform, and uh, it's got a lid now that covers it so you don't see all of that. Well, it took longer than I thought for us to do that. In fact, it took us twice as long because we had to do it twice. We didn't make the hole big enough to get it all in there the first time. And so, you know, some projects just take longer than you think, and finally we're getting to the completion of the project today. But I want to caution you today. This is my caution. Today's message is politically charged. Those of you who are of weak, faint heart on politics, it is politically charged. And I say that because I've never lived in a time in my whole life when the political situation in America and the world so so modeled and illustrated what was going on in the life of Nehemiah. And so it's going to be very politically charged today as he is wrapping up his project on the wall. You see, Nehemiah wanted to build that wall. He wanted to build the wall around Jerusalem. In fact, he wanted to build it to protect the Jews who lived in Jerusalem. He wanted to build it to protect the temple that was in Jerusalem, the house of God. He wanted to protect that. He wanted to establish a boundary or a perimeter. You know, walls, all walls have gates so you can get in and get out. And the walls are so you can close the gates and secure your borders. And that's exactly what Nehemiah wanted to do. And so in the process of doing this, he picks up some adversaries that made it as difficult as possible because they did not want him to secure the temple and the city, and they were... They were hindering him on every side. Now, the people that were trying to hinder him, they were causing the struggle to complete the wall. And the struggle for completing the wall comes from a certain kind of individual. They're called haters. They hate what's going on. They hate it. His haters appeared before he even got on the scene. When he arrived on the scene, we're told in chapter 2 that Nehemiah's enemies, they were angered at his presence that he arrived on the scene. That the king of Persia elected him to come to Jerusalem to build the wall. They hated him. By the time we get to chapter 4, they're conspiring against him. They're plotting against him. And in chapter 6, we find that they will do whatever it takes to remove him. I call these people the never Nehemiahers. I made that up. You know, it kind of comes from that slogan, never Trumpers, but the never Nehemiahers. They would do whatever it would take to remove this leader from his office. That's what was going on. The haters are identified. They're identified as Sanballat, who was the Horonite or of, of Samaria. He's a Samaritan. Tobiah. Tobiah is an Ammonite, and so that's a surrounding nation. He doesn't want this happening either. Geshem is of the Arab community. We know from other passages in Nehemiah that the Philistines are in on this. All the surrounding nations, they don't want him. It says, and the rest of our enemies, when they heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it at all, all the way around, the perimeter was set. The only thing left to be done was to set up the gates of the city. He says, that's what I said, there's no breach left, though up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates. The wall is almost 100% completed. He's got to put the, the, wall, the, the gates up so they can actually secure the city. It says, at that time, they really got angry. <laughs> they intended to do me harm. He says, specifically, it's two of them, Sanballat and Geshem. They sent to me saying, come, let us meet together. Now, here's one of those names that's really hard to pronounce, right? Let's meet together at Hakkepharim. I don't know if I even said that right. I know how it's supposed to be said, but I don't think it came out right. In the plain of Ono. Now, Ono, I, I, can, I, I can say that name. 
That's an easy one. I said, that's actually a city name, but can, can you imagine? I wonder if it was named after a man by the name of Oh No. Probably when he's born, they looked at him and said, Oh No. <laughs> I don't know. But in any case, this, this location, Oh No, he says, Hey, come, we want, you. we want to meet with you. Come away from the city of Jerusalem, about 20 miles away, to Oh No. We'll sit down, we're going to talk about what you're doing. <laughs> They would do anything to stop the progress that he was making. And so Nehemiah adds here, but they intended to do me harm. I knew what this was all about. So here's, his re here, here's the, the haters are rejected. They hate him, what he's doing. And I sent a messenger, message, messengers to them, and I said, I am doing a great work. I cannot calm down. Why should the work stop while I leave it to come down to you? He's saying, I'm just too busy to fall into your trap. I'm not going to stop what I am doing. My work is too valuable. He just blows them off. Well, you know what happens when you blow people off? They become very persistent. And they sent to me four times in the way, this way. Come on, we want to we want to meet in the valley. We want to meet. No, no. We 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 we've said to ourselves, oh no, he can't be doing this. And they're trying to pull him away from the work that he is doing for the Lord. And I answer to them the same matter, in the same manner. No, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. No, I'm doing a great work. No, I'm building the wall. No, no, no. You know, it seems like, and I see this all the time, if you just are persistent long enough, you're going to get what you want, and that's the way everyone feels. And that's the way it is in the press. I found this interesting uh, display or, or, or little image of how the press has been treating our president. For the months of June and July, they have on the one side, on the left-hand side, uh, they have... All, all the press's reports and their opinion reports that are given in the news about Vice President Joe Biden. On the right side is their coverage of their opinion about the news about Donald Trump. And on the left side, as you can see, there's like just four negative comments and all these, like twice as many positive comments. They're marked in the green, the positive in the green, and the negative in the red. And on the other side, on the right-hand side, we have all the negative comments marked in the red and the positive comments in the green. Do you, and, and this independent outside media research organization is saying there's bias in the news. Now, is that a, like, are the lights going on for you? Or you're saying, uh, the lights have been on for a long time. Listen, what I'm trying to say is the same thing was going on in Nehemiah's day. Nehemiah was up against this. It is out there. They just keep, you know, if you say something that, that is a lie long enough, people will begin to believe it. And that's what they're doing here. In fact, it'll get worse as the passage goes on. The fifth time what they sent a letter, it's an open letter. By that, it means that they didn't put a seal on it, and the seal of breaking it was uh, by penalty of death, okay, because these are legal documents. He's saying uh, they didn't seal it this time, so anyone along the way could, hey, did you know what, what, hey, there's this, and they would spill it all out. The whole idea was to leak the information. Have you ever noticed when there's a transfer of powers between one administration to the next, there's all of a sudden a huge number of Leakers? All this information is being spilled out, and they're saying, where did that come from? The leaker, the person who didn't like the election, then begins to put out little notices about what's going on, feeding the press, feeding the opposition, so that they can try to bring down the party. That is what is going on. Now, they didn't use the, the Internet. They didn't use Twitter. They didn't use Facebook. They didn't use CNN or New York Times or the Detroit News or Free Press. They didn't use that. They leaked it by word of mouth and gossip. I still think that kind of thing goes on today. 
again and again. The haters are persistent. They're trying to take down their governor, Nehemiah. You know, once the hate is not working, people pick up on that. Then they kicked into a second gear. The second gear is hoax, a hoax. Now, hoaxer is not a word, so I had to invent this word. And so a hoaxer, I call them hoaxers. They turn from hatred to making up the storyline so they can take down the opposition person. Anything like that ever happened in our culture? You know what I'm talking about? Fake news, you make up a fake story. The fake story that is uncooperated. The fake news kicks in on Nehemiah. The open letter was in hand, and in it was written. Here it is. It is reported among the nations. Who reported it? Anonymous sources. Have you ever watched evening news and heard this? Well, my sources tell me. Well, there are good, reliable sources that say. Well, then tell us who they are. These are anonymous sources. When you hear anonymous sources, you've got to say, I cannot believe anything that follows out of their mouths. Because that anonymous source could be lying. And in many cases, they are. They're lying. In Nehemiah's day, they actually were lying. It is reported among the nations. And guess what? Geshem also says it. Well, who is Geshem? He's an Ammonite. He can't stand the Jews. He can't stand Nehemiah. He hates him. So what's he going to do? He's going to back a lie, knowing it's a lie, even, even knowing it's not true. He's going to back that so he can take down Nehemiah. Nothing like that would ever happen today, of course, right? Never happened today. Here's the lie. He has written and that it says that you, Nehemiah, and the Jews intend to rebel. Your whole intention is you're going to rebel against the king of Persia, and you're going to actually set up yourself as the king, and that's why you're building the wall, so you can rebel. Sounds like a good argument. It's just not true. It's just not true. And according to these reports, you wish to become the king. They're attributing evil motives to him, which he never had, and reporting it by one person telling another person the same talking points over and over and over, and you get enough so you can say, the nations are about to tell this to the king of Persia. All according to these reports, you wish to become king. Hmm. This is a bold-faced lie. Bold-faced lie. The media lying then, like the media lying today. Folks, listen, I've been saying this all along. You've got to do your own research. You've got to do your own research. It was all fake news. All fake news. Well, the hoax conclusion is that there is a collusion. Have you ever heard of this before? Oh, my goodness. He says here, and you, Nehemiah, have also set up prophets. You're colluding with the prophets. You've got something on the prophets, and you're, it's a quid pro quo. I almost didn't say that right. <laughs> you, you are setting this thing up you, so that you can proclaim yourself as king in Jerusalem. It's a setup. <laughs> oh, my goodness. If you don't see the connection here, we had a Mueller investigation that took us 22 months to get through everything. 2,800 subpoenas. 19 high-profile, very expensive lawyers, all of the opposition party, spending 25 million tax dollars. Your, your money. With 500 interviews and over 40 FBI agents, and the result was there was no, conclu no collusion, no collusion, no collusion. All fake news. That's what they are accusing Nehemiah of. You colluded with the prophets so that the prophets will get you into office as king. Sound very familiar? Sound very familiar. 
I've never been a time in history when our political world today matched so much the time of Nehemiah. Hmm. The hoax is threat. Now the king will hear of the reports. These hoaxers are threatening. We're going to hit the leak button, and we're going to leak all of this to the king of Persia, and he's going to come down with swift justice on the land of Judah, Jerusalem, and he's going to bring an end to it all. The problem is the king authorized Nehemiah to do this. They're on the wrong side of the whole thing. On the wrong side. And so he says, now, this is what they said. Now, the argument is, because we're going to do all of this, come now, meet with us, meet with us. Why? Because they wanted to do him harm. To do him harm. Well, the hatred didn't work. The hoax isn't working. Because the hoax is rejected. Then I sent to him saying, no such things as you say, have been done. Outright denial. It is all a hoax. And you are inventing them. You're manufacturing them out of your own minds. You're making it up. The whole quid quo pro. <laughs> For the impeachment. That whole thing was manufactured they didn't think, his enemies did not think that he would actually reveal the phone conversation that they made up a story about. They made up a story about what went down. And then they, they, they actually stated the story. But then our president asked the president of Ukraine, can I release the actual phone call? He said yes. They never thought this would happen in a million years and he released it, and we found out it was all made up. It was. You're inventing this stuff, Nehemiah says. Just because you say it does not make it so. Wow. Fake news. Fake news. Well, the hoax wasn't working, you see. But Nehemiah says here, he says, for they wanted to frighten us. That's the whole purpose of the hoax. And I underline, underscore, us. He doesn't say here, they all wanted to frighten me because he wasn't frightened. You know why? We want to know why? Because he has been praying morning and night, morning and night, that God's hand of blessing would be upon him. And he was not afraid. But his people, he was afraid they would be afraid. For they wanted to frighten us, thinking that their hands, his people's hands, will drop from the work, and it will, won't be done. They're trying to intimidate. That's what's going on here. Poor Nehemiah. He's got everything going on, just like it is today. But here's the hoax's demise. It's in a tweet. It is. For they all wanted us to, to be frightened, thinking that their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But he gives a little tweet. But it's not a tweet on Twitter. It's a tweet of a prayer. He says, but now, O oh God, he doesn't attack them. He attacks by just lifting a prayer up to God and say, God, strengthen my hands to get the job done. To get the job done. He doesn't attack the other side. He says, God, strengthen me to get the job done. So, the hater didn't work. The hoaxers didn't work. But maybe if we had some spies. If we had spies on the inside, we could get this whole regime toppled. Ever hear of anything like that? Maybe like the FBI, the CIA and getting a FISA warrant based upon all lies and fake news in order to topple a sitting leader of a nation? Oh, you never heard of anything like that. In Nehemiah's day, the spy is identified for us. Wouldn't it have been nice if they would have at least named the accusers in the Mueller investigation and also in the impeachment trials? The accuser was never, ever named. Is that wrong or what? You know it's wrong. I don't care what side of the political parties you're on. You know that's not right. 
To be accused and never know who your accuser is? That's just downright wrong. At least Nehemiah knew who his accusers were. Now, I, when I went into the house of Shemaiah, there's his name. It's written bold right there. I, I, I put it in red. It's not really red in the original Hebrew. <laughs> I, I did that to it. bring your attention to it. Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mahatabal, who was confirmed, who was confirmed to his home, was confined to his home, and he says, this is what he says. Now, we don't know why he's confined to his home. I, I can suppose why he's confined to his home. He's about to make a prophecy wanting to confine Nehemiah uh, to, his, to the temple of God, and so in order to be an object lesson, he has confined himself to his home, said, come to me, and, and he's a prophet, the Shemaiah. And he says, this is this line, it's like the talking point. Did you ever notice that ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, MSNBC, and even now Fox, they all have the same talking points? They say the exact same thing. This expression, let us meet together, just reoccurs in the text. It's the talking point. Let us meet together in the house of God. This prophet is saying, let's go up to the house of God within the temple. Let's close and bolt the doors in the temple, for they are coming to kill you, and they are coming to kill you tonight. He's the prophet. Nehemiah knows something's really fishy about this, maybe because it was the talking point. Maybe that tipped him off, the talking point. What he's wanting him to do is seclude himself in the temple. And this is kind of like secluding yourself in the basement because there's a threat outside my basement. It's the enemy, the invisible virus. Here, it's not the invisible virus. He is being told, hey, you need to lock down in the temple because there's some people coming to get you tonight. But the spy story is rejected completely. But I said, should such a man as I run away? Wait, wait. Leaders don't run away. Leaders don't lead from behind. That's called driving the people. The leader steps out in front and he leads the people. What do you expect me to do? A man such as I? I'm going to hide because somebody made a threat? Are you kidding me? There may be even more to that. Because he says, I will not go in. I will not go in. What he says, he says, I understand what's going on here. Let me expose for you what's going on. I understood and saw that God had not sent Shemaiah. God didn't send him. He's a false prophet. He had pronounced a prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat hired him. <laughs> he was a hired gun. He was the hired hit man. He was the hired guy to take me down. He was a prophet for sale. He is a false prophet. Right there in the land of Israel. Right there, surrounding the temple of God. He said, for this purpose he was hired. We all know by now, or at least we should know, that there was no collusion on the part of our president, but there was a collusion on the part of the FBI, the Democrat Party, and all the rest to try to take down our sitting president. We should know this. The way it worked was the Democrat Party had hired Fusion GPS to do opposition research on the president, then president-elect. The research led them to hire a spy, Steele, to make up this fraudulent dossier. They then leaked the dossier to the press and also to all the other agencies because the administration in their last month declared that anything was going in, in, in one department was going to be shared among all the agencies. So it was shared among all the agencies, this false document, this dossier, the entire public had it, and based on that dossier, the FBI sought a warrant, even though the FBI had already determined that it was false, it was fake, it wasn't real. And, and they, they, based on that, they sought the courts to spy on the President of the United States of America. That's exactly what Nehemiah is facing in this passage. 
For this purpose, they hired a spy, a false prophet, that I should be afraid and act in, a, in, act in, uh, in this way and sin. There's the key. They were trying to get Nehemiah to do something wrong so they could say, aha, we got him. We got to take this man down. What was the sin? Well, Shemaiah said, let's go into the temple. Let's go into the sanctuary. But Nehemiah, he wasn't a priest. He wasn't a, a descendant of Aaron, and he even wasn't even a descendant of Levi. For him to go in would be to desecrate the sanctuary. And he said, I can't not do that. That would be sin. And if you got me to sin, then you could do this. You could give me a bad name in order to taunt me and to take me down. Nehemiah was protecting the office that he held at this point as the governor appointed by the king of Persia over Jerusalem. He was protecting it. That I should be afraid, that was the goal, and act in a sinful way. And so what did he do? He responds with another tweet. <laughs> That's what he does. It's like two together because it's a little bit longer than one. He, he sends this tweet up to God. And he says, remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh God. You, say, you know what he's saying? Uh, vengeance is yours, Lord. You repay. Vengeance is yours, Lord. You repay. Remember these guys according to the things that they did. And also the prophetess Noah, Noadiah. Obviously there were other prophets that were in on this collusion to take down Nehemiah. And the rest of the prophets, he said, who wanted, want to make me afraid. There is a conspiracy out there to get me. All right, now that I've gotten out of all the politics out of this passage, we're through the politics that's making building and completing the wall around Jerusalem so difficult for Nehemiah. There's enemies on the outside. There's problems on the inside. He's dealt with all the, uh, all the unrest on the inside. He solved that problem, but now he's got all this junk, political junk going on on the inside. With all that politics out of the way, this is what happens. They have a speedy completion of the wall. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elu in, the, in 52 days. People, scholars today say, you just can't, you couldn't have done that in 52 days. Well, but he did. He did. The, the text says he did. God said he did. And we're told in the passage how that happened. Nehemiah tells us how it happened. That it happened in 52 days. It's like miraculous. But our God is a God of miracles. He had a speedy finish. In less than two months, he rebuilds the walls. The gates are set up. And that speedy recovery and rebuilding of the, nation, of the city walls of Jerusalem leaves a legacy to Nehemiah that he completed the wall. He did. He did it. He did it. He did it. It says, and when our enemies heard, see, this is the legacy. They heard. Everyone knows. It's recorded in the Bible. We know today. Everyone heard. He said, all the nations around us were afraid. Did you get that? They're afraid. The word afraid means fear. I think it's a fearful respect. They now respect Nehemiah. They now respect the little, little city of Jerusalem with its temple and its, its sparsely populated at this point because it was not a place to live before this. It is sparsely populated, but they all feared. Nehemiah had great respect at this point. Not only did he have respect, but at this point, his enemies fell greatly in their own esteem. The wind was taken out of their sails. And they now had a great esteem for Nehemiah himself. After this, they also perceived oh, this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. They said, what? God was helping Nehemiah. Now, notice it says their God, because they didn't serve that same God. Back then and, and, and that day, everybody had their local God. The Canaanites had their God, and the, and the Babylonians had their God, the Egyptians had their God, and so they perceived that 
Jehovah, the true and living God, helped the Jews. Their God was just better than these other gods. Wow, what a legacy. Amazing legacy. Now then we come to the very last couple verses of the, the chapter, and we come to the aftermath of the completion of the wall. And you would think that, oh, and everyone lived happily ever after, right? The wall is complete and everything. Uh, not so. In the aftermath of building the wall, poor Nehemiah has to deal with the deep state. The deep state? Yeah, there was deep state back then, just as there is deep state right now. He's got to deal with the deep state. He says, moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah, these are the people of nobility, that when, when Nehemiah came back, he found them there. He inherited them there. I'm a pastor, and every pastor that I've done, every church I've gone to, I've inherited a new board. I didn't get to pick them. I had to live with them. <laughs> and we'd work, and we'd work together, and we'd work, and you figure out how are we going to work and, and, and work in the church. He didn't pick these nobility that were there in Jerusalem. That's what he inherited. He said, it says here, and in those days the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah the Ammonite. What? These are people who have been in position and had contracts and they had relationships with the enemies long before Nehemiah arrives on the scene. Just like when every president comes into office, he has to deal with all the bureaucrats that were already in power when he came into office. This is what Nehemiah is dealing with. And so the letters came from them, for many in Judah were bound to him uh, by an oath. By an oath, they were bound to Tobiah. Because he was the son-in-law of Shekinah, the son of Ara, uh, the son of Jeho Jehohana, I'm watching all these today, uh, had taken the daughter of Meshulam and the son of Berkiah as a wife. You see what's going on here? They had negotiated contracts. Because they have political power here and political power there, we're going to negotiate a contract. Folks, I, I don't know how else to say it, but we've got in our culture today the same thing happens. That's why we have a guy like Hunter Biden, uh, Hunter Biden negotiating contracts with foreign entities like Ukraine and China. It's because his dad was the president, vice president. And so he's got clout that nobody else has. That's what's going on here. It's the deep state. Because there's a political power and we got ties, we're doing business and transactions. You got a disruptor like Nehemiah who comes on the scene and he's disrupting everything. And so we got this communication going on between the enemy and the nobles in the land. Many in Judah were bound by an oath. Oh, they had former contracts. All because they had violated the law of God and intermarried with the Ammonites, which God said not to do because he wanted to preserve the Jewish race as pure because the Messiah had to be a descendant from the Jews, the tribe of Judah. What we're dealing with here is the deep state. And it says, they also spoke of his good deeds. In my presence reported my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. The deep state was agitating and causing problems. Now, it's not going to end here. The this, this same guy, Tobiah, is going to wind up being in the very last chapter of the book. All the days of Nehemiah, he is hounded by the deep state. He's hounded by the deep state. It gets so bad that when Nehemiah goes back to Persia in the 13th chapter, while he's away, the priests, the family members that they're tied into by marriage, actually takes the storehouse out of the temple, takes all the grain and everything out of it, and lets Tobiah set it up as home. So you have a pagan in the temple of God desecrating the temple. And when Nehemiah comes back, you know what he does? No, my, no, he does just like Jesus does. He goes in and he grabs all his stuff and he throws it out of the, the storage area of the, of the temple. He cleanses the temple of Tobiah. Listen, the deep state hounded him and hounded him. All right, this is what we call the swamp. This is what we call the swamp. He had to get rid of the swamp, had to drain the swamp. So what do we take away from this? I know what you're thinking. Whew. 
when we take away something about the president, no, it's not about the president. This is not about our president. He's a great illustration of what Nehemiah went through. And uh, so you're saying, oh, so it's all about Nehemiah. No, it's not even really about Nehemiah. So you're saying, then who's it all about? I'm going to tell you who it's all about. It's really all about us, you and me. All of this is about you and me. You say, how do you get that out of this? Well, I don't. I go to the New Testament. In the book of Romans, it says, for whatever was written in former days. Oh. You see, Nehemiah wrote this after it all happened, so it obviously wasn't to give him a, hey, heads up here, this is what's going to go down. <laughs> Every bit of it was written for who? For us, for our instruction. That through endurance and that through encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. What's the hope? If Nehemiah can make it through, we can make it through. Anytime you're getting like, hey man, I'm just a little hopeless here, I'll tell you what to do. Open your Bible up to Revelation chapter 19, 20, 21, and 22, and you're going to find out we win. It's that simple. There's the hope. It's in the Word. Listen. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter, 11, it's, uh, chapter 10, verse 11, it says this. Now, these things happen. All these things in the Old Testament, they all happened to them as examples. Why do you think all this stuff's going down now? Well, it's in the Bible. What has been, will be, and is yet to come. It's, it's, it, it says it's examples. But they're written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Listen, God recorded the Bible, Nehemiah, for us. For us. So the bottom line is, what do we want to learn from this? What, what do we take away from this today? When you follow the Lord, this is my first takeaway. When you follow the Lord like Nehemiah did, you will be hated. Listen to Jesus. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. They hated him so much they crucified the Lord of glory. If they really had known who he was, they would not have have crucified him, 1 Corinthians tells us. Paul will later say this, all who live godly, if you're living godly, in Christ Jesus as a Christian, you will suffer persecution. You will be hated. That's our takeaway. Being a Christian is not for sissies. Being a Christian means when you stand up for Jesus and righteousness, what is right, people will hate you. It's a given. The second takeaway here is don't be deceived. Beware of, quote, fake news, false prophets. Beware of falsehood. He said, beware of false prophets who come into you in sheep's clothing. They're telling you what you want to hear, but are ravenous wolves on the inside. They're not for you. They're against you. They'll tickle your ears. They make promises they have no intentions of keeping. So you have to look at their track record. Where do they really stand? He wants us to be wise, not deceived. You will be spied on. It happened in the early church. There were Judaizers who are called false brothers, secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. They were coming in in order to make slaves out of them to their political agenda, which was Judaism, that you have to be circumcised. You just change the terms, but it's all the same. Same stuff going on. You have to be careful of those who come in with a different motive than what they say, and they come to spy on your freedom in Christ Jesus. The final takeaway here is you've got to finish what God wants you to do. You finish what you start. Don't quit. So the wall was finished in 52 days. Record pace. Why? Because he wouldn't get sidetracked with all the garbage, all the swamp. He wasn't going to get stuck in the swamp. He stayed away from the swamp. He, he stayed away from it all. And he finished the task in record time. Why? Because God was helping him. 
you know, my, my burden is for the church. My burden is for the church. And I don't want to get sidetracked by all the junk. Because Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's all about us today and the church. I don't want any of that other junk clouding our vision. We have a church, we have a mandate to share the gospel to every creature, and we're to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we're to teach them whatsoever the Lord commanded us, and I got a whole Bible full of his commands. I'm to teach the word. What do I take away? People are going to hate me for doing that. They'll try to deceive me, get me off track. They'll even spy on me, come in, and try to thwart me from the inside. But I've got to finish the task because the gates of hell will not prevail against what the Lord wants us to do. Isn't that great? So we wrap up the sixth chapter, the actual completion. Next week, we're going to do a survey of the remaining seven chapters, chapters 7 through 13. We're going to survey them because the theme then turns from, okay, we got the wall built. Now, at this point, we need to revive the people. We've got to revive the nation. We've got to get to the heart and soul, heart and soul of the people. And we're going to survey what Nehemiah does to bring revival to the land. But let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, we pray that we will be faithful on our task and our mission, uh, Lord, to make genuine followers of Jesus Christ who have made the great confession, who love the Lord with all their heart and love their neighbor as themselves and who share their faith everywhere they go. Uh, the great commandment, the great confession, the great commission that we're doing it all, Lord. Knowing that as we jump to the end of the Bible, even though it can be a hard task, on the end, at the end, we win. Jesus Christ rules and he reigns, and we are with him forever. Make us obedient, obedient to your word and to the will of God, to the end, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.